So, um, welcome to this online lecture. And the title of this lecture is uh, The Visual and Textual Exemplars of the Art of Dying. And mainly I'm going to discuss how the members of the Order of St. John and people who are quite high on the social scale would have experienced the process of death and how death would have been, would have acted as a paradigm, as an exemplar for the people lower down on the social scale, the, the commoners. So basically, I'm going to, to focus my, my, my talk on three basic arguments, which are the following. I'm going to discuss the funeral ritual of and the visual culture pertaining to the elite or the ruling class, with a special emphasis on the members of the Order of St. John and this church here, the conventual church of St. John, which was the church of the, of the order. Uh, we're going to discuss how the funeral ritual and the accompanying visual culture as practiced by the ruling class would have influenced all the other people lower down on the social scale. Uh, the, the commoners. And last but not least, uh, we're going to discuss how the presence of the plague, because I'm mainly going to discuss the 18th century, um, and the plague was present in Malta um, in, 17, in, in 1676 and again in 1813. So the 18th century was basically free of the plague, but the fear of the plague was always very much here in, in Malta. So we're going to discuss how the presence of the plague or the fear thereof or, or the fear of the plague and the rich poor dialectic it emphasized would have helped to shape certain beliefs and patterns of behavior regarding death. And um, we're going to start with a sort of um, example and I'm going to deal with the death, the process of death, because death was a process as we shall see, that actually extended itself throughout one's life. In the midst of life, we are in death, people used, used to say. And I want to start with, with this, this example, uh, the, with the death of uh, Grandmaster Antonio Manuel de Villena, uh, which happened in, 17, late, uh, in late 1736. This is the portrait, this incredibly majestic portrait made by Pietro Paolo Troisi, full-length portrait of Grandmaster Villena. And in late 1736, Grandmaster Villena was particularly ill. He had this very complicated infection, it seems, of the urinary tract. The doctors couldn't do too much to help him. And at some point, the doctors had to leave to allow religion to enter. Science had to leave to allow faith to, to, to follow. And the process of that to really start. And one very important process during the process of that, one very important moment, if you like, in the process of that, was the drawing up of a last will and testament. And um, fortunately, the last will and testament of Villena, or the dispropriamento, or disproprio, of, or the spolio of uh, Grandmaster Villena, still, <coughs> still exists. And this is um, uh, taken from his testament. He is using the majestic plural, Noi Fra Antonio Emanuel de Villena, which was typical of all grandmasters. He is saying that he is the umele, maestro del ordine, uh, the, del hospital San Giovanni. He was the grandmaster, the humble grandmaster. Uh, see this, uh, he is emphasizing his humility. This was very, very important in the process of death as practiced by the elite class. They were always um, emphasizing their supposed humility. Uh, Maestro del Ordeno del Hospital San Giovanni de, de Jerusalem, el, de, el del Santo Sepolcro, e custode dei poveri, as he's writing here, e, e custodian of the poor. And this, this link that the rich always made with the poor was also considered to be very important. Uh, Trovandoci per la Dio grazia sano di mente. He's saying this was very typical of all testaments of the Grand Masters, of all testaments in general, to tell you the truth, that he was very much... Um, uh, possessing all his mental faculties. His body was infirm, he was very, very sick, but his mental faculties was all working in perfect order. So his testament, drawn up with the help of, of a notary, makes sense. And then again, again, Villena is again and again stressing his humility. Um, he wants, for example, as you can well see from the, these, these quotes uh, from his um, write up of the testament that his funeral fugge ogni eccesso, that there wouldn't be any excess when his funeral is being organized. Ci uniformiamo all'uso solito. We want a very typical, normal funeral. And then he does something which is incredible, which is not typical 
of the other grandmasters. He says that upon my death, or just before my death, I want the limousine, the triemesse. I'm giving enough money um, because I want three masses to be said in honor of my soul, so that my soul could travel as quickly as possible to reach God above, to reach heaven. Now, why is this so, so interesting? Because three masses that Villena was asking for are really, really a, a little, a, a very small number. Other grandmasters would have wanted thousands of masses. Let me give you an idea. So, for example, Gregorio Caraffa, when he was writing his own spolio, he wanted 1,500 masses to be said in perpetuity, obviously, lasting forever, to help to aid his soul in its travels in the afterlife. Other examples, Perellos, he, he went really for uh, an incredibly large number. He wanted 6,000 masses to be said in his honor. Vilena, we've just mentioned him, three masses. Despuig, and I'm going to discuss Despuig later on, uh, 3,000 masses. And just um, there on, 2,000 masses. And just to give you an idea what a normal person would have wanted to, this Paolo de Guara, who was just a person, a normal person maybe, he was quite well off, but quite a normal person, who died in 1785 when he was around 40 years old, he managed to gather enough money to have 200 masses, which might look pitiful next to Perello 6,000, but it was quite a good number, even when compared to Villena's. Now, what I think that Villena was asking for there, he wasn't really asking for just three masses, I think, uh, but this is just my interpretation, that he was asking each and every priest living in Malta, whether belonging to the order or whether belonging to the diocese, he was asking each and every priest to recite three masses. And at the time in Malta, there were more than 1,000 uh, priests, so make that times three, and that would make it around 3,000 masses anyway. So possibly Villena wasn't as humble as he might have wanted to himself to be, to be seen. What's also interesting is that Villena most probably was very conversant with the geography of the afterlife as practiced or as, um, as believed by the Catholic, as, by the Catholic world. Um, because let's talk a little bit about the geography of the afterlife according to the Catholic world. So there is death, obviously. And soon after that, it was believed that um, this thing happens, particular judgment, it was called, which means that the soul of the dead person would be immediately judged as soon as that happens. And once um, the soul passes through this particular judgment, the soul had four specific places where to go. Heaven, purgatory, hell, or limbo. Now, let me give you a brief definition of each. Heaven, obviously, was reserved for perfect souls, souls without any taint of sin whatsoever. Hell was the exact opposite, obviously. Hell was reserved for souls mired in mortal sin. So, uh, once particular judgment is meted out, the soul either went to one or the other. If it went to heaven, it will remain in heaven for eternity. If it went to hell, there was no hope. It will be there for eternity. Then there was, there was limbo as well, and that was reserved for, for the unbaptized souls, hence that obsession with baptizing babies as soon as they were born, because there was limbo waiting for them otherwise. And then there was this thing called purgatory, quite a complex thing, and that was the place where most people, possibly villain included, would have thought that that would be the place they would go after their death, because this was an intermediary place, somewhere between heaven and hell. And that was, purgatory was the place reserved for souls still having sins to atone for. What's interesting with purgatory was that, okay, the soul might go in purgatory, but at some point, the soul had to travel to heaven. So purgatory was not eternal. And the length of time a soul had to wait in purgatory, that uh, very much, um, whether the, 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 the stay was short or long, that was very much determined on, for example, the number of masses said in honor of that soul. Hence this obsession with all those masses. But when Villena wanted all those masses, three masses said 
by each and every priest residing in Malta, said very soon after his death, or just before his death, as he said in his testament, then he was going for the, um, this, this, sharp of, this sort of sharp attitude. He wanted the stratagem where so many masses would be said immediately. So he was hoping that in the particular judgment, he would be judged in a very positive, positive way. The longest a soul could remain in purgatory was until the last judgment, until the end of time. At the end of time, those souls still um, residing, if you like, still being purged in purgatory, would travel, would travel to, to heaven. So the process of death, as you can well see, was very, very important. The last hours especially, known as the agonia, were extremely important. Now, the word agonia actually comes from the Greek agon, which means uh, battle. And the battle was actually between good and bad sources, um, the forces, uh, the, the, the good forces and the bad forces fighting for the soul of the dying man. As well as we can see in this picture here that is found in Birkirkara's parish church. You can see the dying man, the agonizante, as he was known on his deathbed, but he happens to be a good man. So he is surrounded with the priest who is administering the last rites. All those saints next to him, we can see an array of light which is already showing the way that he's, he's going straight up to heaven. And the devil is defeated. He is cowering beneath the bed. So this is um, a good agony, if you like. Something that Vilena would have hoped for. Now we've been mentioning the, the humility of Vilena or the supposed humility of Vilena. I don't think that he was that humble, after all, because six years before his death, Vilena actually commissioned this incredible funeral monument in his honor, in this church here, the conventual church of St. John, his church, if you like. And the artist who was commissioned to do this particular um, funerary monument was the artist Massimiliano Soldani Benzi. And as you can well see, there is nothing humble about this monument. Um, it is a monument that celebrates how great, how important Villena was when he was alive. If anything, the centerpiece of the monument is his gilt portrait. And there are certain symbols that tell us how great, again, how majestic Grandmaster Villena was. For example, we can see two putti here, one holding the rapier and one holding the cap. The rapier and the cap were given, were bestowed upon Villena by Pope Benedict the Thirteenth. On the sarcophagus, which makes a, a little bit of an allusion to that, the, the, the image itself, the, 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 the monument itself, is very celebratory. It hardly makes any allusions to that. But there is an, an allusion, so to speak, to that in the sarcophagus itself. But on the sarcophagus, we can see... Um, let me show you this we can see this symbolic uh, image of um, the, the allegorical presentation of Fort Manuel to Grandmaster Villena, because Villena, obviously, as we all know, built Fort Manuel, named in his, in his honor. I've talked about the rapier and the cap, and these are details of the putti holding these presents, if you like, that were bestowed uh, upon the Grandmaster by Pope Benedict, uh, Benedict the, the 13th, and last but not least, obviously, there is the gilt portrait, the periwigged portrait of the, of the Grandmaster, which is uh, on either side, we can see wings. Now, why did Villena want wings next to his portrait? As it has been said, the wings could allude to the soul in flight, the soul going from purgatory to heaven, the soul in its travels in the afterlife. But it could well be that those wings there's nothing eschatological, death-like about them, but those wings, again, are celebrating the life of the Grandmaster. As we can see in the slide, the, the symbol of the, of, the, of the soul, of the fleeing soul, would look something like this, like the one that we find on the tomb of Perellos, for example, the skull with the, with the wings next to it, or like the one that we see on the Neapolitan church of Purgatorio ad, ad Arco. But, the coat of arms that we see in the Church of Our Lady of Victory in, in, in Valletta, painted by Alessio Arardi, and again we see the coat of arms of Perellos with the wings, 
attached to it, there is nothing eschatological about it. It's about emphasizing the greatness uh, of the Grand Master, exactly like the wings that we find on the funeral monument of uh, Vilena. So I'm, I'm emphasizing that Vilena wasn't that humble after, after all. And one thing, one other thing, if you like, that again tells us that Vilena wasn't that humble is the commissioning of the Cappella Ardente. This was also commissioned during the time of Vilena. It was designed by Romano Carapecchia. It's a flaming chapel, dismantable flaming chapel. And his job was to decorate the conventual church of St. John, this uh, church here, during funerals of grandmasters or during requiem masses said in honor of bishops or popes or kings or, or whoever. Um, um, it's, it's, it's a, the Cappella Ardente, as, as I was telling you, is a, is a flaming chapel, and that is how it was decorated, with scores of candles decorating it. And the, these candles, imagine the, the Cappella Ardente lit with all these candles, these candles would break the darkness of the church. They, they, would, be, they, they would be symbolic of the afterlife. So let's move to a little uh, subject which is slightly different. Uh, and I'm calling it all, all is vanity. And again, this ties up with how the rich would have accepted that, or how the rich, those higher on the social scale, like Villena, would have accepted or would have processed the experience of that. Now, um, the idea was that that would be uh, quite angry, if you like, when it comes uh, when it came to the rich. And, for example, if, if we were to, to look at this image here, um, which is found in Palermo, in the Palazzo Abatelles in Palermo, the iconography is typical of the triumph of death. We can see death riding astride this emaciated, skeleton-like horse, and that is trampling underfoot all the richer classes, all those higher up on the social scale, whilst leaving completely unscathed, undamaged, the poorer classes who are somewhere here. And uh, in this detail from the same um, fresco in Palermo, you can see the rich who are being shot with arrows, trampled upon and what have you, uh, whereas the poor are being left completely unscathed. If I were to choose uh, a, a similar image, another um, triumph of death, which goes 100 years before death of Palazzo Batellis, and I'm talking about this, which, is, which was painted by Orcania, better known as Nardo di Chones, it's found in the church of Santa Croce, in Florence, it's just a fragment, unfortunately, and the fragment that survives is the bit showing us the poor. And there is a legend next to the poor, and the legend actually is telling us, I'm, I'm going to read it in English, because prosperity has left us, that cure for every pain, come and give us the Last Supper. So basically, that is focusing all his anger on the rich, but the poor are telling him, come to us, and rid us of this world. Remember, life, um, normal life, was considered to be temporary. Um, you have to think about eternal life. That was the idea. The, the, the saying used to go, in the midst of life, we are in death. The Bible itself is actually quite full of um, quotes, which again stress this idea that the, the, the richer classes are, it's very easy for them not to make it to, to heaven. Let me give you an idea. From the book of Ecclesiastes, for example, there is this quote, sweet is the sleep of the laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. And again, from the book of James, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth is rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. And if we were to look at the, the, the motto, if you like, of the order itself, it was there entrenched. The order's motto was protection of faith and assistance of the poor. So this idea that the, 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 those belonging to the richer classes have to think of the poor, have to think of themselves as humble, was very, very important even for the members of the order of St. John. And when it comes to the plague, members of the Order of St. John used plague victims to better their position for the next life as well. 
And the, the, this quote taken from a book that was written just after the plague of 1676 by an unknown author tells us a little bit how the knights would have done their utmost to help sufferers of the plague. It was wonderful to behold the knights, soaked in sweat and utterly exhausted, who carried the infected to hospital, spoke words of encouragement, and distributed arms. They even used their own clothes to keep warm the limbs of the poor. Some ended up dead for the cause. So this idea that one has to be charitable was very, very important, even for the members of the Knights of St. John. And charity, we've mentioned Grandmaster Perellos a little while ago, charity is very much present on his funeral monument. Here we can see this allegorical figure of uh, this mother suckling the baby. That is obviously the perfect symbol of charity. And on his inscription, Perellos wanted this written. In dealing with Christ's poor, he was lavishly merciful. And that reminds me a little bit, this idea of fighting the plague with charity. Uh, it reminds me of this picture here, um, which was present in the Certosa de San Martino in, in Naples, painted by Domenico Gargiulo. And here we can see the Carthusian monks. They're gathered because they're afraid that the plague is coming. And plague is actually there. It's symbolized by this um, withered, haggard, uh, ugly uh, woman. But the, the, the patron saint of the, of the Certosa, San Martino himself, so St. Martin himself, instead of fighting plague, he is showing love to her. He is, again, cutting part of his cloak to clothe and um, thankfully cover the withered breasts of the symbol of plague. So this idea, this idea that love conquers everything, that charity conquers everything, in the end, we can even find it, for example, in this picture by Simone Vouet, which is called Time Vanquished by Love, Hope and Fame, which very much ties up with this subject that I am talking about. Members of the Order of St. John, buried here in, 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 in their, in their uh, conventual church, again would have wanted this emphasized on their marble tomb slabs. The, mar the Intarsia mar marble tomb slab that I'm showing you here, this belongs to Mattia Preti, the great painter, the one who actually painted and basically redesigned the interior of this, of this church. And this is what he wanted to have written on his tomb, his in the inscription that is. He gave up an immense sum of money earned from his paintings to the poor. So again, this idea that the rich have to think of the poor, possibly to save themselves. And there is this book that must have been very well known amongst members of the order. It was written by this Jesuit scholar, Etienne Binet. Um, it's, it's called Sovrani ed efficaci rimedi contro la peste. So this was written um, in, face, in face of the plague. And some, some, some arguments that Binet comes up with are the following. Plague is ultimately a blessing, he says. Plague is a way how people could save themselves. Plague, it makes people more aware of the trappings of the world and its vanities. Another argument that Binet comes up with is that because of the plague, the minds of the people become all, all set for salvation. One starts thinking more about the afterlife rather about this life. Plague is the perfect goat to faith. Plague is something that pushes us um, near our faith. As, as a result, people strove to become better Christians to overcome the fear of the plague, one is to live dying. Si vive morendo. As, I, as that quote that I've said a little while ago, uh, which was very popular at the time, in the 17th and 18th centuries, in the midst of life, we are in that. And that is why that was considered to be a process, a process that extended itself throughout one's, throughout one's life. In many ways, the beautiful, incredibly beautiful flooring of the conventual Church of St. John is a reminder of all this. It's a reminder that members of the order, they might have been important, they might have been well off in life, but they had to be humble, they had to think of the poor, um, they had to think about saving their soul. So some of the marble tomb slabs that, that, that we find in the conventual church of St. John stress this point, such as, for example, the marble tomb slab of Fra Felice Dallando, which shows us the skeleton in front of a prison, uh, and, and the inscription above it tells us la morte è fin d'una prigione oscura, which means that that releases us from this dark prison. The dark prison, obviously, would mean life, life itself. 
something quite similar we find on the tomb of Fra Roberto Solaro, where there is written, life and time are volatile, only eternity is steady. There's, there's always this obsession that life is just a transient phase. One has to think about the next life. And I think uh, one of the best examples of these memento mori, as we call them, type of um, symbology is found on the tomb, uh, on the marble tomb slab of Franz Selm de Kai, uh, and, and there's written, um, you who tread on me will be trodden upon, even you reflect on this and pray for me. Now, if, we, if, if, if I were to choose two um, portraits of two very distinct, very different grandmasters, you can see this idea as well. One, the one uh, which is showing us Grandmaster Winyakur painted in the reactionary um, period of the Counter-Reformation. It's very dark, very brooding, very morbid, if you like. We see the Grandmaster in this sort of dark uh, black setting. He is sitting next to a standing crucifix. He is reading the Bible, most probably. And on the other hand, he is holding the rosary beads with the strange terminal on one side, definitely, there is a skull, you can see it, and most probably, if one were to turn that, there would be the face of Jesus. So that is very much the sort of humble, morbid atmosphere that we find soon after, or in the, in the reactionary counter-reformation period. But um, a very later portrait of a completely different grandmaster, uh, Antoine Favre's um, portrait of Grandmaster Pinto, that morbidity, um, is, not lo is no longer there. And we see the Grand Master here, uh, very grand, very beautifully dressed in this sort of majestic theatrical setting. Um, there, there are very few allusions to religion there. Uh, this portrait is telling us about the grandness of the Grand Master. And the same sort of thinking is found on the tombs of these two Grand Masters. This is the tomb of Grandmaster uh, Winniakur. It's very simple, as you can well see. And the inscription tells us, again, this, this humble thing that I was talking about, an chastity, guiltless modesty, unaware of deceit. Whereas the, um, the funeral monument of Pinto by Vincenzo Pacetti, uh, again, is trying to tell us about the gr greatness of the memorial fact uh, of the Grandmaster. In fact, we can see Fama itself, that winged figure with the trumpet. And we see the, the angel with the downturned torch, which is the only allusion that we find in this monument to that. It's, uh, there's a very, very big difference. Uh, it's, it's, it's a monument that is almost classical in, in inspiration. Okay, let's move to another case study, if you like. Uh, we've talked about Villenas, um, process of death, if you like. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the following Grandmaster, and that would be Grandmaster Raimondo Despuig, which took place in early 1741. So this is the Grandmaster we are going to talk uh, about. We happen to know so much about the process of death of Despuig, because there is a journal, a diary, if you like, uh, written by the Ignacio Saverio Mifsud. And in this diary, in this journal, um, which uh, Mifsud used, used to write in, in, in the mid-18th century, in this diary, uh, Mifsud was, it seems, a little bit partial when it came to funerals and the process of that, and he gives us so many uh, details about uh, Despuig and his death. For example, we know that at the time, um, there was this big drought in Malta that hadn't rained for more than four months. And with the passing away of the Spuig, something miraculous happened. The skies opened up and this torrential rain fell on Malta. And people, the commoners, looked up at this as if it were a miracle. Um, and this is something that, that people used to do repeatedly. They would um, graft saintly prodigy on the deaths, on the process of death, of these um, members of the elite class. Now, if, if, if you are to look at this votive picture, this has nothing to do with, with this twig, but it might give us an idea of the process of that. This is a little votive picture that is found in Talherban, Birkirkara. The, the dying person, the agonizante, if you like, must have belonged to the Order of St. John. In fact, if you look just above him, you can see the eight-pointed cross. But one thing which is very important here, you can see the doctor 
who is still visiting the patient. But in a little while, he's going to leave. This was a very, very important point when the doctor would realize that he couldn't do anymore to help the, 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 the patient. And now is the time of faith to continue. And you can see the priest, along with the acolyte, coming with the Holy Eucharist to start um, the last rites, which was a very, very important step in this process of death that we are talking about. It's a detail of this picture that I've been talking about. Now, the spig, obviously, um, the, the last hours of the spig, the agonia, as we've said a little while ago, would have happened here. This was the palace of the Grand Master. This is where um, the spig would have lived and he would have experienced his death in his apartment here. So in a little while, the, 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 the place, the palace where the Sprig lived, and this was also the seat of the government, obviously, had to be turned into a palace of death. And the Grand Master's palace, very, very quickly, had to be turned by an army of craftsmen and artists, who unfortunately remain anonymous, most of them, and in the space of a couple of days, it would have been turned into um, a palace of death. Um, it would, beautifully decorated with coat of arms, with insignia, with, with eulogies written in Latin about the Grand Master, and with symbols of death, many, many symbols of death. And we know, again, through Ignatius of Arium Sud, because he tells us so much in his journal, that most probably, soon after that, uh, the body of Villena was put in this room here, known as the Sala del Maggior Concilio. This is where the body of Elena was put. This is where his body would have been embalmed. We know all this, as I was telling you, through Ignatius Averio Mifsut. And he tells us, for example, aprire al catavere per l'imbalzamento, in that room there. And then the, the body, fu esposto in publico in una sala grande. Um, it, it was laid in state for people to look at in the Sala Grande, in the Sala del Maggior Consiglio. La, la medesima sala, the same hall, quale nel Giovedì Santo, on Monday Thursday, si fa la cena, there would have been this, this supper for, for poor people, and where these poor people would have had their feet washed by the Grand Master. La sala era tutta, era tutta parata di lutto, as Saverio Mestru is telling us. The, the hall would have been beautifully decorated in black uh, cloth, in black draperies. And then, um, I'm simply choosing bits and pieces, il catavere era torniato con quantità di antorcia. The, 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 the body would have been um, surrounded with light, with torches. Um, and one very important thing that Saverio Mefsu tells us, um, quattro soldati, four soldiers were needed to keep, per riparare il gran numero del popolo, to keep away the, the, the people the crowd of people who went to look at the embalmed body of the Grand Master. As I've said, people would have looked up at these deaths as if they were exemplars, as if they were paradigms. Furono presi l'interiore. Now, this is quite interesting as well. Now, when, when the body was opened for embalming, um, some, some organs, some vital organs, the precordia, they were called, would have been taken up and they would have been buried in another church. This time round, they were buried in the church of Our Lady of Victory. It, it might sound morbid, but yes, these grand masters would have wanted their mortal remains to be buried not just in one place, but to be buried at least in two places, in the hope that more people would remember them and would pray for their, for their soul, and hopefully they, uh, their soul would make that quick transition from purgatory to the to, to heaven. And then um, Saverio Mefsut, who was quite morbid, as, as I've been telling you in his, in his writings, he tells us these quite morbid details. He tells us, for example, that when the body was opened, it saw a quarry, his, the, the heart of the grandmaster, was found to be troppo piccolo. It was found to be a little bit too, too, too small. Um, e la bocca della stomaca, and, and the opening to the stomach, um, un poco stretta, was closed. Uh, e per questo tutto quel che mangiava di nuovo lo buttava. That, that's why he couldn't keep the food in his, in his stomach. A little bit too morbid perhaps, but anyway. The più, and then he tells us this, this thing, the più li, li fu trovato il cervello di smisurata grandezza. He's telling us, 
again, possibly emphasizing this thing that the Grandmaster was not human at all, he was beyond human, he tells us that his brain was found to be larger than normal. And then the diary of Saverium F. Sout continues with the process of that, and he tells us uh, soon after the body was laid in state in the palace, embalmed and what have you, the body would have been taken to this church here. Because the process uh, of that, if you like, would have happened when it comes to the Grandmaster between the palace of the Grandmasters and the conventual church. Entrato poi il catavere fu posto nella cappella ardente. Obviously, for this week, the cappella ardente, the dismantable chapel, the dismantable flaming chapel, was put up again. Numero infinito de candele. Again, he's stressing this obsession with, with this immense number of candles. The church was appartata di lutto. Again, the church was dressed up for the occasion. Ad ogni colonna si mirava una figura de morte. Um, on each and every column, there would have been symbols of death and the stemma gentilizia di questo principe and the coat of arms of this grandmaster. Entrato il catavere, incominciarono a celebrarsi messe lette in ogni altare. Can you imagine that? In every altar of the church, um, a, a, a mass was said at the same time. There must have been so much noise going on at the same time within the church. And so many people were trying to enter the church uh, because Mifsu tells us um, there were soldiers, again, per riparare il popolo che concorse in questa chiesa in gran numero. Commoners would have wanted to witness the whole thing firsthand. And to give you an idea of the beauty of the Cappella Ardente when it was set up, I have these two photographs, 20th century, because it was still being in use in the first half of the 20th century, and you can see the majesty of the whole thing lit up with this numero infinito, the candele, as um, Saverio Mifsud would, would tell us. Okay, so let's move to a slightly different topic. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how members of the Order of St. John would have thought of experiencing a heroic death, a heroic martyr's death. And one place which played a very important role in putting in the minds of the novices this obsession that they might need to experience this death, uh, um, a heroic death, is this place here uh, that, that we are in, the, the oratory of the decollation of St. John. And this oratory, as we can see it today, is the oratory as redesigned by Mattia Preti. But the oratory, originally, didn't look like the one that we see today. And this print here might give us an idea how the oratory would have looked. So it was much simpler, much darker, it seems. The picture uh, by Mattia Prieti, by Caravaggio, sorry, was still very much, uh, was already very much there. But there is another lunette picture there that we cannot see, see today. On the lateral walls, um, not really visible in this print, but um, still very much present, there would have been images of saints of the order. Um, some of those saints that, for example, the historian of the order, Giacomo Bosio, would have um, written about in his, in his book, Le Immagine dei Santi e Beati del, dell'Ordine. So all these novices, uh, these young knights visiting this oratory here, would have seen these pictures that I'm going to talk about, and that would have put inside their head that possibly they have to do something like St. John the Baptist, um, as, as painted by Caravaggio here, or some of these saints of the order um, meeting this martyr's death. The idea that the order's job is to fight the infidel, to fight the forces of darkness, is an idea that, for example, we find in this lunette picture that Mattia Prieti and his bottega had painted in the church of Saria. Here we can see um, Michael Archangel, who looks like a knight of St. John himself, fighting the forces of darkness. So that is how the order or members of the order thought of themselves. They have this job to do. They have to fight the infidel. They have to fight the forces of darkness. So in, in this photo montage, you can get an idea of how the oratory would have looked before Mattia Preti. So much darker than the oratory as we know it today, 
with the uh, painting of Caravaggio, the beheading of St. John, and, and this other uh, lunette picture that I'm going to, to discuss. So imagine the young novices visiting this place. They would have had a sort of walk-in instruction manual, if you like. Um, in front of them, they would have seen their patron saint dying for his faith, meeting this terrible end, decapitation, because of his faith. And then they would have seen the saints of the order on the lateral walls again dying, perhaps, for their faith as well. But the thing that really possibly impressed them was the lunette that was just above Caravaggio's picture, which is not here anymore. It was taken down by Mattia Prieti, in fact, but it still exists. And we find it today in the friary, in the refectory of the friary of the Franciscan conventuals in Rabat. It, it is a terrible picture. In fact, we see many members, young members of the Order of St. John, these knights, who are succumbing, who are dying, who are being martyred in the hands of the Muslims, of the infidels, as they used to call them. And, and we know that some novices were afraid, actually, of entering this um, oratory only because this picture was too close to home. It was showing people who looked exactly like them who are being brutally slain and martyred by the Muslims. You can see the angels there, the, the little putti, they're handing out these palms of martyrdom because they are dying a martyr's death whilst trying to um, keep the enemy at, at bay. So the oratory, as, as we see it today, is the oratory as redesigned by Mattia Preti. Mattia Preti took the martyr's lunette uh, away, uh, possibly he found it a little, a little bit too morbid, and he replaced the cycle of saints of the order with a new cycle. For example, this is one of them, Saint Nicasio, from Mattia Preti's new cycle of paintings. So the martyr's lunette ended up to... It, it, it wasn't accepted anymore within the conventual church and the oratory, but Mattia Preti actually painted his own lunette. Not in the, in the oratory, but in the church itself, in the controfacciata, in the inner western wall of the church. And he painted this, almost replacing the other lunette that ended up in, in Rabat. It shows the allegory of the triumph of the order. And here, the morbidity that we've seen in the, in the earlier picture is transformed into something a little bit more majestic. And we can see the, the order as exemplified by this figure here, figure of victory, if you like, trampling underfoot the infidel, the Muslim, as you can well see here. But there are still some gory details, not as gory as in the Martin's lunette, but they're still very much present. For example, here we can see some of these uh, young knights being martyred anyhow. And there's this quite, quite morbid detail. There's this young knight who is completely decapitated. So we can see the, 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 the severed neck there hanging um, with all that blood oozing out. And what's interesting is that at the other end of the, of the church, we can see a figure that looks very similar to that knight another de decapitated figure, but this time round, that is John the Baptist, obviously. So we can see the young knight there mirroring the, exactly the same death of the patron saint. Uh, in a time where this sort of mirror literature was very uh, popular, we can see this sort of speculum literature, mirror literature, very much present in the church of Saint, the conventual church of Saint John. Now, this is the last case study that I want to talk about. Um, we've talked so much about the Order of St. John. Now, time has passed a little bit. We're in the, in the very early years of the 19th century, and I'm going to talk about the process of that of um, uh, definitely an, an, an elite member who did not belong to the Order of St. John. By the time the Order of St. John was expelled from Malta, Malta had underwent this shift from the Order to the French to the British, at the time it was a British protectorate, this was 1808, in Malta, this young count um, came, came to Malta, um, the count Louis Charles 
Dor Leon, the Count, uh, the Comte de Bujole, he came to Malta with his brother, it seems, um, only to try to regain his health. He was very sick, uh, it seems, and he was ordered by his doctors, he, he, he was only 28 years old, and he was ordered by his doctors to find a more favorable climate. And along with his brother, he came to Malta in the hope of regaining his, his health. He was the son of the guillotined king of France. So I came to Malta. The thing didn't work out according to plan because the Count Bujole um, died just two weeks after his arrival in Malta. And the new British um, government of Malta, if you like, and the uh, Bishop of Malta decided to give the young Count um, who died in Malta um, a formidable funeral. And again, the Cappella Ardente, it seems, was, was erected in his honor. This was 1808. Um, a, a requiem mass was said, and his body, it seems, was buried in Bartolot's crypt, in the crypt of Bartolot. But 10 years later, when things t calmed down a little bit in, in Europe, the body of the count was brought up again, a new requiem mass was said again with the setting up of the Capella Ardente, and this time round, uh, we know quite a bit about the second funeral, because at the, at the um, National Library, there is a document um, drawn up by this Giuseppe Bartolo, and Bartolo, very morbidly, gave us, gives us drawings, very accurate drawings, of the coffin itself in which the body or the remains of the count were put. He tells us that the coffin fu tutto foderato di velluto di seta, cremise, red, deep red, inchiodata, hammered, con chiodi d'argento, with, with nails, with silver, silver nails, ed ornamenti, e tutto in argento fino. He even tells us how the pole bearers, there were 12 of them, would have stood around the coffin to carry the coffin. And here he gives us another drawing of, about how the whole thing was set up. He even possibly shows us the box in which the precordia, remember, we've used that word, these vital organs, um, the heart most probably, and some other vital organs were stored and buried not at St. John's, like the Grand Masters would have done, but the precordia, in this case, were buried in the Church of Taliz. And if you were to go to the Church of Taliz, here in Valletta, there is a, a, a marble uh, pl plaque, a commemorative marble plaque, which tells us exactly the place where the precordia of, of the, the young count are buried. So again, his mortal remains are buried in two specific places. In the conventual church, eventually his remains were buried, or reburied rather, in the chapel of the French Lung, and um, the precordia uh, buried in, at Thales in, in Valletta. In a private collection, there is this watercolor painting by Antonacci Grec, which again shows or illustrates the second requiem mass given to the count. And we can see the interior of St. John beautifully decorated with these black curtains to, to, give the, to, to, to communicate the idea of that. And we can see as well, right in the middle of the nave, the Cappella Ardente. And this happened, the second burial of the Count, if you like, happened 10 years after his death. So this was 1818. On the occasion, um, this marble plaque was put in the chapel of France in remembrance of the death of the Count. It's very classical looking, and we can see a big, big change happening from the tombs erected to the Grand Masters to this tomb here, which emphasizes the mourner rather than the dead person. But then, uh, by the way, this was uh, made by the French sculptor Augustin Felix Fortin. And then in 1848, a new um, monument was given to, to the Count, this time round made by Jean-Jacques Pradier. And the second monument, instead of replacing the first one, the two monuments were somehow beautifully combined, as you can well see. And then the second monument given to the count, we have this very romanticized um, portrait of the count who lies nostalgically on the floor 
uh, in a very romantic sort of mood, holding a paper in his hand, possibly showing the map of France, the country from where he was, he was uh, expelled. So the whole thing would look something like this. We can see a big, big difference from those celebratory um, monuments erected in honor of the Grand Masters. The one last thing that I want to tell you is that um, the Jean-Jacques Pradier monument is actually a replica of another monument made to the same count, in fact, that we find in the north of France, in, in the Palace Chapel in Drew, which was likewise made by Jean-Jacques Pradier. So Jean-Jacques Pradier did the same monument for the same person twice, once for the Palace Chapel in Drew, the Royal Chapel in Drew, and once for the conventual church of St. John. That, that was all. Hope it was interesting enough. Thank you. Thank you very much.